Today on America's Test Kitchen, we're cooking sous vide. Dan shows Julia a perfect recipe for herb-crusted roast beef. Adam reveals his top pick for handheld vacuum sealers. Lisa reviews funnels. And Julia makes Bridget the perfect creme brulee. It's all coming up right here on America's Test Kitchen. Sous vide is a cooking technique that uses a precise water temperature to cook foods through perfectly and make recipes foolproof. We often use it for things like poached eggs or the ultimate steak. But there are a handful of recipes that can only be done with sous vide, like a medium rare pot roast, which is what Dan's going to show us how to make today. So Julia, chuck roast is one of the beefiest cuts mm. on the cow, right? We absolutely love it. We grind it into burgers. We make pot roast out of it. You'd never in a million years imagine that we would put it as the centerpiece on a holiday table. No, because right? if you cook it medium rare, it would be tough and chewy. Right. So what we're going to do through the power of sous vide, which is really, really amazing, is we're going to cook this thing medium rare, edge to edge. It's going to be as tender as prime rib, but it's going to be even beefier. So we're going to start with a five pound chuck roast here, and it often has a layer of fat down the middle. Mm -hmm. And the meat will actually pull apart at these natural seams pretty easily. So you kind of start separating with your hands a little bit, and you can see it right there. Then I just grab my knife, and I'm going to use the knife as, as little as I need to, basically. A lot of pulling, that means it will come apart perfectly at that seam. So we'll just separate it out, and really the only reason we're doing this is we want to access these pockets of fat and get rid of some of the bigger ones. Beautiful. That looks great. So another really nice benefit of taking this apart here is we're going to season this with salt, and this gives us a ton more surface area to season. So I have four teaspoons of kosher salt, and I'm just going to let it rain down all over <laughs> this guy. So what I'm going to do is put this back together now. I'm going to set this aside and get my strings ready. So we're going to tie this back together. There's a lot of ways to do it. I like to lay it out ahead of time, and then you just pop your roast on top of it. We want about an inch apart. So now I'm going to put the roast presentation side down. And then I'm going to start in the middle. I'm going to come up and over, and then I'm going to do a double twist. Nice, secure way to do it. It mm -hmm. kind of locks it in place so that it holds it for you pretty nicely. Yep. When you go back to do your second one, it's still nice and tight. Okay, so now I'm just going to trim off the uh, little extra bits of twine on here. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to wrap it up in plastic now. I'm going to transfer it to a plate. We're going to go in the fridge for at least 24 hours, up to 96 hours. So our roast sat in the fridge for about 48 hours, so it's really well seasoned. So we'll pat it dry with some paper towels real quick. In the meantime, I've got my skillet over here with two tablespoons of oil, and I'm heating that up over medium-high heat. So I see some whiffs of smoke. We're going to get our roast in there now. Smoking hot. Smoking hot. So I'm going to start on the side, actually, and then kind of let it roll down. And we're going to sear for about six to eight minutes. We want to get beautiful browning all over it. All right. Okay, that is gorgeous browning. We've done that on all sides, that final side. Want to make sure you get your ends Ooh. too. Looks beautiful. That's gorgeous. Awesome. So we're going to transfer it over to our plate here. I'm going to season it with pepper now, about one and a quarter teaspoons. Okay, so now it's time to start really cooking this thing. <laughs> and so we're going to reach for our trusty freezer bag. We're going to be sous vide and we need to have a plastic barrier around the meat so that it's not in contact with the water. We want to use a zipper lock bag which is easy to get in and out of and the freezer bags are a lot sturdier. So what I like to do is open it up and then make a little cuff on it. Mm -hmm. We're going to transfer this in there. It's going to get messy and if you get it inside here, you can make that seal a little bit messy. This isn't even that hot. No need to use tongs. And then I'm just going to give it a little turn here so that it fits in snugly. We're going to start pressing some air out. Air is a really good insulator. It's going to affect how evenly this cooks. Ideally, there's no barrier other than that thin piece of plastic between the meat and the water. So I'm going to squeeze out as much as I can and just kind of work my way up and start sealing it. We're going to come over to our water bath here. So we have our immersion circulator circulating here. And this is a 12-quart container. You need something large enough because you're cooking something pretty big. Right. This is set at 133 degrees Fahrenheit. Pretty low. But it's the final temperature we want this roast to be. We're going to leave it in there 18 to 24 Ooh. hours. When we normally cook this roast, we cook it at pretty high temperatures because we want to break down all that tough collagen into mm -hmm. nice tender gelatin. Right. And that happens pretty rapidly at, say, 180 or 190 degrees. A couple of hours, it's tender. We're going much, much lower, but we can actually get that same collagen conversion. It just takes much, much longer. A so, whole day. A whole day, basically. <laughs> yep. So what we're going to do is pop it in here. Mm -hmm. Water pressing against the plastic, it's going to displace some of that air. And as that air climbs to the top of the bag, I'm going to open up one <laughs> little bit here. We're going to use that cool water displacement to help get rid of the last bit of air in there. So you want that nice and closed. And then I've just got a little binder clip here. Mm -hmm. You just want to make sure that this doesn't, during the long cook, fall off. I'm also going to put a cover on it. So we're going to have some evaporation. Enough evaporation that it could go down too low. And we don't want that to happen. It's also going to make it easier for the machine to maintain 133 degrees. Now the question I'm sure everyone's asking is, 
is this a safe cooking technique? Because that's a low temperature for a long time. It is, and the key is really this combination of time and temperature. So 133 degrees is very, very low, but because we're going so long, we actually kill bacteria very slowly over time. So it's really totally safe to eat, even after a few hours in this kind of bath. So it's totally safe when it comes out. All right, so 24 hours. So we're gonna go 24 hours, and you're gonna see the best chuck roast you've ever seen. Can't wait. Okay, so this has gone for 24 hours. We have an amazing transformation happening mm. inside the bag that I'm excited for you to see. So I'm gonna take this roast out of the bag here and I'm putting it onto a wire rack that's set in a rim baking sheet. I have a sheet of foil under there and I've sprayed the rack with cooking spray so it doesn't stick. So we're gonna let this rest for about 10 to 15 minutes here just to help it kind of evaporate off some of that moisture. We're gonna pat it dry before it gets a gorgeous, gorgeous mustard, rosemary, peppercorn crust. It has really, really bold flavor and to match that, we're gonna make this awesome yogurt sauce. Ooh. I love this on basically any roast, but it's gonna be really killer here. So we've got two cups of whole milk yogurt here. Now you want that richness, you don't wanna go with low fat or non-fat. I also have a quarter cup of minced parsley. We also have a quarter cup of minced chives. I have two teaspoons of lemon zest. We're also gonna add a quarter of a cup of lemon juice. So we have some nice acidity to match that yogurt acidity. And then finally, two minced garlic cloves. All right, so just whisk this together. It's gonna hit it with a little bit of kosher salt and some pepper. Ooh, that looks good. That looks nice, This right? is my kind of sauce, I have to say. Awesome. All right, so a little plastic here. We really want the flavors to meld a bit. We'll let this sit in the fridge for at least 30 minutes. So you might have thought that what we're doing in the sous vide bath, that was the big story for this recipe, <laughs> right? This crust could totally steal the show. Oh, really? Yeah, it's really, really awesome. We're gonna start with some mustard seeds and I have a quarter cup here. It's gonna go into my trusty spice grinder. I also have three tablespoons of black peppercorns. These also have texture and a little bit of flavor. All right, so I want these to be coarsely ground, so I'm gonna do kind of pulses and a little bit of shaking. It's gonna look like a weird dance. <laughs> All right. You gotta put your hips into it if you're gonna dance. I'm not a big hip dancer. All right, so here we go. So we've got this mixture here. We're gonna transfer it to this shallow dish and we're gonna stir in rosemary. So I've got mm. a third of a cup of finely chopped rosemary. We're also gonna add two tablespoons of flake sea salt. Ooh. It's gonna add tons of flavor and texture. So we're just gonna mix this together. I like to use my hands. Okay, so we want this to stick to that and the key to that is this egg white. So we're just gonna do about 30 seconds of whisking here. Great, nice and foamy. So I patted my roast nice and dry. And you're leaving the twine on, I wanna point out. That, that's true, I'm gonna leave it on right until the very end when we actually slice and serve this, and that way it holds it together. So I'm gonna use my pastry brush here and just paint it all over. So now we'll just take this and press it in over here. This dish makes it nice and easy to get ah. lots on there. So this roast is ready to go into the oven. It's gonna be a 475 degree oven for about 15 to 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. We're gonna rotate it halfway through and we're looking for this to be really aromatic, really, really beautiful and golden brown. This thing is cooked through. We don't need any interior cooking. We just want that crust to set and be really beautiful. Oh. Ooh, does that look pretty or what? That's a beauty. It smells good too, doesn't it? It does. Oh, well that sure turned around. Right? <laughs> So let's transfer this right over to our carving board here. Oh, beautiful. Yes, please. So here's the crazy thing is we don't have to let this rest at all. That's crazy. It's really cool, right? Yeah, because we cooked at such a low temperature, all the carryover cooking that was ever gonna happen is done at this point. Wow. And the time in the oven is so short, there's no need to do it. Wow, I love it. Look at that. Good. You ever seen a chuck roast that looks like I've that? I've never <laughs> seen a medium rare chuck roast before. I mean, this knife just, I'm barely doing anything. It just glides right through it. Can I serve you some? Please. All right. And I'm gonna pull off just a little bit of twine that we still have on there. Helps it hold together during the slicing, which is really nice. All right, transfer a nice chunk over to you oh, here. thank you. There we go. Gorgeous. Nice. All right, would you like a little sauce yes, too? Yes, of course. There you go. Ugh. Look at that. Mmm. Mm-hmm. So tender. It's beefy. It has more flavor than a roast beef I've ever had before. It mm. just tastes like good beef. And the flavor of that crust with the mustard seeds and the rosemary, it's beautiful. So good. This is amazing, Dan. Well done. Thank you. So there you have it. If you want to try something new with your sous vide machine, try a chuck roast. Pull the roast into two pieces, then trim, season with salt, and tie it back together. 
Let the roast sit with the salt for at least a day, then brown on the stovetop before sous viding at 133 degrees for 18 to 24 hours. To finish, coat the roast with a spice mixture and brown it in the oven for 15 minutes. And don't forget the yogurt sauce. So from America's Dust Kitchen to your kitchen, a killer new recipe for sous vide rosemary mustard seed crusted roast beef. Awesome. Every holiday table, right? Oh, now on. So good. Vacuum sealers are a great way to keep food fresher longer, and you can shell out a thousand bucks for one of those countertop versions. But Adam's here to tell us whether the handheld versions, which are cheaper, are any good. You know, Bridget, air is the enemy when we're talking about food storage. And you're right, those countertop vacuum sealers are huge yes. and expensive. Yes. Handheld models offer a much cheaper, much smaller, much easier to store alternative. We were wondering whether they worked as well as the countertop mm -hmm. models. So we have four different handheld vacuum okay. sealers. The price range was about $8 to $40. And the tests included sealing strawberries, ground coffee, blade steaks, and chicken legs in bags of different sizes to store in the freezer. Okay. We also sealed chocolate chip cookies, which you're gonna be doing later, and portions of cereal to store at room temperature in the pantry. And testers sort of checked out the bags for any air that got into the bags for food decay over the course of a month gotcha. regularly. Now, all of the sealers come with their own bags to use. They look a lot like a zip top bag, but they're a little different. The plastic is a little thicker, and we learned that they take a little more effort to seal really carefully. Testers ended up just putting them down on a work surface and running their fingers over the seal repeatedly to make sure that it was sealed really well. They found this out because there were a couple of seal failures early on. Now, this model actually suffered a couple of seal failures in the bags once they were closed correctly mm -hmm. too. And that led the testers to research the composition of the bags. They called the manufacturers and they learned that all the bags have a couple of kinds of plastic. They all have polyethylene, which is really common. It's sure. used in grocery bags, it's all kinds of things. Three of them also included nylon. The one that had problems with getting some air into the food didn't have nylon, instead it had polyester. And we checked with our own science editor who said that nylon is actually a better gas barrier than polyester is. So we figured that the polyester is the reason that the bags for some of these got a little bit of air in them after a while. This one is a manually operated vacuum sealer. You would just put it right onto the valve there and pump. Okay. Like a reverse bicycle pump. pump. The other ones are all electric. And they all worked pretty well. They were simple to use. Sure. All of them sealed the bags in about 20 seconds or less, depending on the size of the bag and what was in there. But they weren't all equally comfortable to use. And I want you to try this white and green one on this bag. You okay. just put the sealer right over the valve. Okay. And right press here. the button, and it's going to suck the air out, and you're going to tell me what you think. All right. Takes a little while. Oh, it's really hard to hold. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know that I'm actually doing anything, and this feels like uh, it's gonna fall out of my hand. Uh, exactly. Yep. There, there we go. go. So we're forming the vacuum there. This is not, not good. This is <laughs> not comfortable at all. I'm like holding it with two hands. It's, it's very awkward and very heavy. Um, that's exactly what the testers felt. That was the heaviest one at more than a pound. They felt like it wasn't ergonomically designed. The power button didn't connect well. Exactly. It's got this little gridded thing here for grip, supposedly. Yeah. No grip. Didn't really help. No. Now, these two were the other electric models. They're both lighter. They're nine and three quarter ounces and 12 and three eighth ounces, respectively. Okay. These work really well. This one, the bag with the coffee got some air in it over the course of the month. So testers actually in the end gave the nod to this guy here. Why don't you try this right. on those cookies there, <laughs> which we want fresh for a snack. Look at that. Yep. Nice. The possibilities are endless there. <laughs> so much lighter, so much more comfortable, perfectly effective. The bags that were sealed with this one never got any air in them over the course of the month. So this is the winner. It's the Gormia Handheld Vacuum Sealer Set. $22 for the vacuum sealer and some bags. And you know what? Testers really felt like this was a perfectly effective, obviously much less expensive and easier to store alternative to those huge countertop models. Well, there you go. If you have food to save, like 
chocolate chip cookies? Just eat them. But if you want to <laughs> save them, then buy the winner. It's the Gourmia handheld vacuum sealer set, and it runs $22. How hard could it be to make a funnel? Pretty simple, right? But it turns out funnels get complicated fast. We tested six brands, including some sets, priced from $4 to $14, transferring lots of foods and liquids with different textures like peppercorns, olive oil, herbs, and barbecue sauce. We poured them all through the funnels into a variety of containers. Along the way, we looked at how easy the funnels were to use, store, and clean, and whether they were durable. Now, there are two key factors flow, and stability. Now look, this squishy silicone one didn't flow. It was like milking a cow trying to get the food to drop down. Stumpy little spouts like this one, unstable. It tries to tip over as soon as you pour because it won't stay anchored in the container. This one also started flaking off little bits of plastic after we washed it. Who wants that in your food? But after all that, we had a winner. This classic funnel is sturdy, with a wide four inch opening on top, so it's easy to pour into with no mess. It also has the longest spout, almost two inches, so it goes deep into the container and it stays in place while you pour. It passed all our tests. This is the Winco PF8 plastic funnel, eight ounce size, and it's only about $4. We all know that sous vide cooking is great for main course dishes, but what about dessert? Julia's going to show us why sous vide might be the perfect application for making creme brulee. Mm -hmm. Creme you brulee? Said it. <laughs> creme brulee. Well, if you think about creme brulee or any custard, it's a very heat sensitive technique. You have to temper the yolks, heat the cream, and then you have that water bath that the creme brulee ramekins sit open air in the oven and that water bath I've ruined many creme brulee when you get a little wave going in the water bath and it goes up over the rim of the ramekin and it washes out one of the creme brulees every time surfs up <laughs> so using the sous vide takes all that out of the equation right yeah so we're going to start with the only flavoring really in a creme brulee which is vanilla this is half a vanilla bean now to get all the flavor you can out of the bean you want to cut it in half lengthwise then split open the pod with the tip of a paring knife and scrape out those seeds because mm. that is where the flavor is that's actually the bean mm, you got it all right so i've scraped out all of the seeds i'm going to take the pods and i'm going to put them in the bowl this is five yolks, this is the thickener of our creme brulee. I'm gonna scrape the seeds off the knife and get it down into that bowl. Now I'm gonna add the cream. This is two cups of heavy cream. And to this I'm gonna add a third of a cup of granulated sugar, which is not a lot of sugar. This isn't gonna be too sweet. Now whisk this together and just add a pinch of salt. That's a little bit. All right, now whisk this together. All right, that looks good and well mixed. And now we're gonna strain it, get out those vanilla pods and any bits that we don't want in the final creme brulee. And that is as easy as it gets. Now, we're not gonna put open air ramekins into the sous vide. <laughs> we're gonna use jars, mason jars, because they have lids that fit nice and tight. So these are eight ounce wide mouth mason jars. All right, so we're just gonna fill up these mason jars. I'm gonna fill them most of the way and then I'll go back and make sure they're evenly filled. Now, if you didn't have a vanilla bean, you could use vanilla extract. You would just use about a teaspoon. But I love seeing the little specks of vanilla at the bottom of a creme brulee. All right, so before we put the lids on, I'm just gonna take each ramekin and tap it lightly against the counter just to get any air bubbles up to the surface. All right, you wanna help me put the lids on? Sure. You wanna put them on fairly tight, but not super tight. So now we're gonna put these into this sous vide and the water is set at 180 degrees. Well, that's pretty close to a final temperature of a creme brulee, which is usually around 170. You got it. So they're going to be in here for an hour to an hour and 15 minutes. And notice this is just a canning tool. It's called a jar lifter. If you didn't have this, you could use a pair of tongs, wrap rubber bands around the ends so that it gives it a little bit more purchase. We're going to put the lid on. We're going to let this cook for an hour to an hour and a quarter. All right, so it's been an hour and these guys are ready to come out. Now I'm going to take these out of the water. Look how easy this is. No creme brulee sacrifices. Seriously, I always make extra because I always lose a few. All right, we're gonna let these cool at room temperature for about an hour, and then they're gonna go in the fridge for at least four hours till they're nice and chilled. But you can do this up to three days ahead of time. All right, these are nicely chilled and we're ready for the finale. 
So you can see there's a little bit of condensation that has accumulated on the top, and you want to get that off before you start burning the sugar because it'll get in the way. If you wouldn't mind helping, sure. take a little paper towel and you just kind of lay it on top and let it absorb the moisture. And the creme brulee is so nicely set at that point, you really don't have to worry. If you get a little ding in the custard, the sugar's going to cover that right up. Now we're going to sprinkle about a teaspoon of sugar right over the top. Turbinata sugar makes the best coating. It melts evenly. It has a little more flavor than granulated sugar. Toss the sugar around the top so it's a nice, even layer. And then you want to wipe any off the rim because it'll burn right onto the rim. Time for the fire. These are a little bit more fragile than a ramekin, so you really don't want the flame of the torch hitting the edges too long. All right, so. <laughs> You're serious. Here's my blowtorch. Now, I much prefer to use this because it's a nice, strong flame, yep. and it's a great presentation to walk in the dining room with this. Of course, you could use a smaller gun if you right. wanted to. And as always, make sure your hair's back, make sure there's no fabric flowing in front of the flame because it is a live flame. Gotcha. Yeah, it's what we used to use in the restaurants as well. That's right. I like to hold mine upside down like this. And then again, you just hit it. And again, just being mindful of the glass. My inner pyro is very happy right now. You notice how I'm putting the heat on and off and on and off mm -hmm. because I really don't want to lay the heat on that glass. You just do this until you get the nice brown color that you like. In the vein of letting everyone do their own. There we go. All, All right. right. Your turn. So we're gonna let these sit for just five minutes, let that sugar harden before we crack into it. Pick your jar. Five minutes, I'm gonna go with the one I made. <laughs> oh, nice, I'm gonna choose this one. All right, the best part of eating creme brulee. The crack. The crack. Oh, yes. Mm. Gossamer thin caramel topping there. Mmm. Mmm. That's delicious. I love the texture of this. It's not super set up like a lot of creme brulees that are overcooked and have too many yolks. It's nice and delicate. Yeah, they can be really rubbery and too set up, almost sliceable. Yes. This is perfect. It's almost like ice cream. Mm. And you know, you really get that pure vanilla flavor. So that vanilla bean with all those little seeds inside really shines through. And you get a bit of Vegas action at the end. <laughs> exactly. It's dessert and a show. Well, it turns out the perfect creme brulee might just be out of a sous vide. Start by whisking together vanilla, cream, eggs, and sugar. Strain and portion the mixture into wide mouth mason jars, lower into a water bath, and then cook them for about an hour. Let the jars cool completely and then chill. Sprinkle the custard with turbinado sugar and then brown it with a big old blowtorch. Cool them, of course, for five minutes and eat. So from America's Test Kitchen to your kitchen, the perfect sous vide creme brulee. I'm almost mm -hmm. ready for brulee number two. Now, can you eat this while in a water bath? <laughs> Ooh. Mm, meta. <laughs>